So today's topic is uh, the theme under the theme sadhana. We're going to discuss about sangha. So in sadhana, we're going to discuss five topics. One is uh, devotees association. Then there is deity worship. Uh, then the holy name. Then, uh, then please mute yourself. Yeah, there is holy name and um, there is the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam and the importance of visiting a holy dham or residing in a holy dham. So these five sessions we're going to cover in a period of 10 sessions. So this, uh, these are the most effective processes of sadhana as enlisted in the Chaitanya Chantamrita. But all these topics we're going to approach in a very... Uh, fresh dimension that truly makes us think. So today's topic is Sangha, the association of devotees. So we have heard so many times about the importance of association, right? How glorious it is. Like Srila Prabhupada has said, if a devotee thinks that one can make progress without the association of devotees, then such a person is insane. Yes. And we have uh, heard Shripad Ramanujacharya, who said that, you know, if, to progress on the path of spirituality, one need not do anything. One has to simply sit and be amidst devotees and they will take you where they go. Yes. And of all the process, processes of, uh, associ uh, of bhakti, association of devotee is very, very important and very potent. That is why many a times we see in the Srimad Bhagavatam when devotees actually have the darshan of the Lord and the Lord asks, what do you want? They ask for, you know, please bless me with association of those devotees who are always singing your glories. Yes, and so this is the beauty and the glory of association. And even uh, Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, Mat chitta mat gata prana bodhayanta parasparam kathayantascha maam nityam cha ramanticha. So for my devotees, they always discuss about me, they think about me. Mat chitta mat gata prana and they always uh, preach each other, yeah, they teach each other about me, bodhayanta parasparam. Yeah, and Kathayantas Chamaam Nityam, always they sing my glories. In this way, they relish and they become satisfied. So this is, you know, the dynamics of association of devotees. But today, what we are going to discuss is a very, very uh, important dimension. We all know the importance of Sadhu Sangha. But in today's session, we are going to focus about how should we be a part of that Sangha? So I repeat, we all have heard of the importance of Sadhu Sangha. So in today's session, we're going to discuss about how should we be an efficient part of that Sangha? Because Lord Krishna gives his mercy in the form of giving you the association of devotees. Association of devotees is a very, very rare blessing that we get after many lifetimes. But because of our nature, if we do not utilize that opportunity properly, within no time, one will be ejected from the Sangha. <laughs> and, you know, mind can actually take you for a ride and let you not let you be in the association of devotees for great time. So that is why to preserve this great blessing of Lord Krishna, which is the association of devotees, one needs to know how to conduct oneself in the association of devotees. So today's session is exactly about that. So I will try to enumerate this through some uh, story of Ramayana. After that, through uh, the mindsets of various personalities of Mahabharata, with a conclusion from <clears throat> Srimad Bhagavatam, with some pastimes of Srila Prabhupada. So recently, if uh, any of you is attending the Ramayana session, we were discussing about the Kishkinda Kanda aspect. So 
the Kishkinda Kanda of Ramayana is full of so many wonderful, wonderful lessons for sadhakas. So this is the time in Kishkinda Kanda where Sugriva sends his Vanara Seda in all the four directions to search Mother Sita. So literally there are millions and millions of Vanaras and all these Vanaras went in all the four directions, literally combing the earth to search for Mother Sita. Yes. So there was Vinata who went in the eastern direction. There was Sushena who went in the western direction. There was Shatabali who went in the northern direction. And before they went, Sugriva told all of them that your deadline is 30 days. Within 30 days, you have to get back to me with the news of whether you have found Mother Sita or not. Yeah. If you uh, if you return after that or you know, or, or if you get back without completing your search, then you will be dead. So this is like the extreme position that Sugriva took in the service of Lord Ram. So yes, these, all these, uh, yeah, uh, while all these people went in the eastern, northern and western direction, the special mission went on the southern direction because that was where he was suspecting Mother Sita to be in. So this uh, southern troop was headed by Hanuman and also Angada, Angada who is the son of Vali. So it was almost 29 days on it was the time was approaching, the deadline was about to finish and all these troops from the western, eastern and northern direction, they all have returned back with the news saying that <laughs> Sita is not found. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the only hope was to get a news from the southern direction. But from the southern direction, they did not receive any news. It has been almost one month. The deadline is approaching. So what happened to this, uh, the troop which went in the southern direction? So Hanumanji, along with entire Vanara Sena, headed by Angada, they searched through and through. You know, the mountains, the plateaus, the hills, the riversides, the trees, the palaces, the cities, the towns, the villages. Every nook and corner, literally, they searched everywhere for Mother Sita. They have not found her anywhere. And they went further and further and further down. And when they went further down, they came to a, uh, you know, a mystical city, you know, an illusory city called Hemapura. And by, by the time they reached the city, it was just, there was only one day left. It was 29 days. So there they met, uh, it was a very, very luxurious city, which all amenities, yeah, it was whatever their needs were, it was completely met with. And it was a very illusory city. It was nothing like the regular place where they have visited. And in that, there was only one lady. Her name was Swayam Prabha. And this Swayam Prabha is supposed to be the servant of Hema, who is the mother of Mandodari. So, you know, this lady, actually, she's little... Uh, a mystical person, she uh, tells them where to search for Mother Sita and she guides them through meditation out of that illusory maze to the banks of the ocean, yeah, the southern tip of the Indian and peninsula. That's where she takes them, takes them. So she takes them there and she disappears. So at that place, when uh, all these Vanaras, along with uh, Hanuman and Angada, were traversing, they were they were subjected to some very extreme climatic conditions. In those extreme climatic climatic conditions, they found uh, you know their tongues were drying up, yeah, their uh, legs, you know, their feet. The feet were getting charred because of the excessive heat. Yeah, the literally tongues were, you know, jutting out, out of thirst. Yeah, the eyes were weary and they were not finding food anywhere. They were becoming emaciated and weak. And, and worse, and to make things worse, they realized that already deadline was over and it was past one month. Yeah, so the deadline was 30 days and uh, 
it was 60 days by then, you know, in that illusory city, somehow one month has just passed away. So that was their situation. So at that time, Angada, please listen attentively from here. Angada, who's the leader of the troop, yes, he began, he started losing hope. Yeah. And he started losing hope and he started uh, getting all negative thoughts. You know, sometimes when we don't uh, get to accomplish uh, a mission given to us or a task that has been given to us. And it, at that time, it's, uh, we are amidst uh, testing situations, trying situations, the situations of discomfort, the situations of uncertainty, yeah, when, uh, and insecurity. Yeah. So when we are amidst these kind of situations, mind actually enters into a very negative zone. So that's how Angada, who, you know, he, he, he gave into that situation and started talking, addressing all the Vanadas, saying that, you see, we all are going to die anyways. Yeah, uh, because of uh, the situation here. And uh, even if we go back, Sugriva is such a taskmaster that if we go back with the news that we have not found Sita, he is going to execute and kill all of us. So rather than dying in the hands of Sugriva, I want to sit right here and fast until death. Especially, you know, my father Bali has given me to Ram, not Sugriva. And Sugriva, you know, he 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 is an enemy of my father, and I am his enemy's descendant. So he would actually uh, prefer killing me because I'm the lineage of his enemy. So instead of going back and dying in the hands of Sugriva, I want to be here and just fast until death. This is what Sugriva tells. Uh, so all the Vanaras were just, uh, you know, you know, everybody look up to their leader. So all the Vanaras were attentively hearing uh, uh, Angada speak. So Angada said, we will just wait here, sit here and uh, fast until death instead of returning back and dying at the hands of Sugriva. It says, if I go back, I have to die in the hands of Sugriva and in front of all my family members. And this is such a disgrace for me. Instead of that, I would rather sit here and give up my life. So some of the Vanaras present over there actually support the opinion of Sugriva. I'm sorry, support the opinion of Angada. So, but uh, Anna, uh, there is another Vanara, a very famous Vanara. His name is Taru. He comes up with a different opinion. Taru comes and says that, no, 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 you know, we don't have to die. We can remain alive. Yeah, we will all remain alive and we'll all go back to that city, Hemapura, that illusory city. And there, you know, we can have lots of fun. Why should we give up our life? So what if we did not accomplish the mission? We will go back to Hemapura without uh, giving any intimation or news to Sugriva and just spend our rest of our life, you know, enjoying comfort in Hemapura. So, you know, uh, so Hanuman was so Hanuman keeps hearing you know these kind of a different viewpoints. So when he hears these different viewpoints, he comes into the picture. He understands that there was a lot of discord going on uh, amongst the entire Vanaras because of the situation. You know, on one side Angada is telling I'll fast until death and I will die. On the other side, uh, Taru is planning to escape the mission and go and just enjoy his life. Yeah, so this is like leading to total disruption of the entire mission for which they came so far. So Hanuman sensing this entire, uh, uh, you know, opinions being raised, he comes into the picture you know, and 
very wonderfully and amazingly he handles the situation. Yeah, and very intelligently. He comes and tells, he first addresses Angada. Oh, Angada, you're the son of the intelligent Tara and the chivalrous Vali. So, you know, first thing Hanuman does is he reminds Angada of his lineage. Yeah, you're the son of the intelligent Tara and uh, the brave and chivalrous Vali. So, this is not expected of you. Yes. So, and he says that uh, <clears throat> Sugriva is a kind master. But if we go back and report to him about our, uh, you know, attempt and our sincere uh, search to find Mother Sita, I'm sure he would definitely forgive and understand our predicament and not uh, resort to such a cruel, uh, you know, cruel end of, you know, terminating all of us. And then he looks at Taru and, you know, indirectly he addresses. And don't think that by going Hemapura, we are going to escape, uh, you know, the radar of Sugriva and especially the arrows of Lakshmana. Yeah, the arrows of Lakshmana are so penetrating that, you know, they can chase us down from to wherever we are, you know, in the entire universe. And they will terminate us. And Ram need not be involved also in this whole picture. That is how powerful Lakshmana is. So whom are you trying to cheat? This is, you know, Lakshm uh, Hanuman straightens Taru, you know, who had this rebellious attitude. Yeah. And he empathizes with Angad. At the same time, he reminds him of the goodness of Sugriva. So oftentimes what happens is, uh, when we are placed in extreme situations of difficulty, of insecurity, of, uh, you know, of being tested, you know, our lower natures comes up. Somewhere, if we are having some kind of a hidden uh, mistrust, you know, in the authority, uh, you know, it surfaces. So, because until then, uh, Angada was executing the mission of Sugriva. But the time of test came, he started doubting the intention of Sugriva. He started mistrusting. He started saying that he might kill me just because I'm the son of Vali. So, you know, this is what happens. Mistrust breeds when <clears throat> we are not uh, aligned with the master, when we are not, when we are especially subjected to extreme situations. And on the other hand, another attitude that come, that surfaces when we are put in difficult such situations or in, in, this, in the face of failure or in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity is a rebellious nature. Like that of Tarun. He, he said, you know, why should we even be here? We'll just escape and enjoy. You know, this is called the separatist tendencies. So these things also come uh, you know, when we are not, these are all nothing but test of loyalty. Yeah, our loyalty to our towards our uh, the Guru Parampara, you know, to the uh, to our practices is especially tested in the times of difficulties. And it is in the time of difficulties our base nature's surface, just like we saw in the case of Angada, you know, who started doubting the intention of. Uh, his own master and Taru who's, who, uh, who rebelled you know, who secretly rebelled against the instruction and wanted to separate out and enjoy his own life. So these base tendencies, can we relate to this? <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, when uh, we're feeling low in our practices, we just want to do, go ahead and have our own program yeah, or we start doubting, uh, you know, why this person told me to do this. Probably they have their own personal agendas. You know, we start doubting people's intention. Yeah. <laughs> so this is when Hanuman came into picture. And so expertly, he first empathized. Uh, he, you know, he reminded um, Angad of his position. You know, Angad, you're not an ordinary person. 
or the son of the intelligent Tara yeah, and the chivalrous Vali. So a lot is expected of you. Don't lose your hope. You know, he peps him up. Yeah. And he straightens the rebellious attitude of Tarun, saying that, you know, don't think you can escape Lakshmana. And saying these two things, not only he, uh, you know, he expertly handled the situation, he then says, in these times of uh, uh, difficulty, only one thing can save us, that is, uh, take shelter of Ramakatha. And saying this, he starts, you know, singing the glories of Lord Ram. So all the Vanaras, they've just known uh, Lord Ram as some kind of a, you know, a great person, but they never heard of his uh, story. So they were all so excited. They all gathered in that sands of the, uh, you know, the banks or the sands of the beach. They have in circles, so they have grouped around Hanuman and they started hearing and Hanuman started narrating Ramakatha. So he went on and on and on and he told about the descent of Lord Ram, his glories, his pastimes, and you know, he was started telling the glories of Jatayu, how he gave up his life, you know, for the sake of Ram. And he said, We should be like Jatayu. You know, in he, he has given up his life in the mission, fighting for Ram. That is the death that we should all aspire for. You know, not the death of you know, uh, self-immolation in the face of failure. So, so this, so this is uh, Hanuman, how he reacted to the situation. And so, I, I'm narrating this story so that we all try to, uh, you know, <clears throat> relate to each of these characters. So, when we are in a group, when when we are in a sangha. So we are also put through or we are given a task, you know, a mission or a service. So how are we taking ahead those services? So are we uh, like very passive or, uh, you know, especially when we are unable to do that service because of, let's say, many uh, <clears throat> challenges, you know, are we resorting to escape? Why should I do it? You know. Or, uh, you know, are we doubting the very uh, person who has given us the service? Or are we, you know, sincerely trying to, you know, pep up the people around us and try to direct them towards the goal by taking shelter of the Lord? So we see this in the example of Srila Prabhupada and his disciples. You know, when Prabhupada was preaching in the West, uh, he inst Prabhupada is very, very bold and, uh, you know, he used to give such mind-boggling instructions to his disciples. So once when one, one disciple came to Prabhupada asking for some service, Prabhupada said, go to a so-and-so country in the East, extreme East, and uh, preach, start a center. So it was like from West end of the world to the East end of the world. So he packed his bag and he went all the way to preach in this uh, country and a very, very remote country. And I think it was Japan, if I'm not wrong, some country. So this disciple of Prabhupada went there and he started, he tried preaching, but it didn't work out in the initial stages. So this disciple, uh, over a period of time, he lost that momentum and he gave into his old conditionings. You know, and, you know, he totally gave up devotion and he felt, Pray to his old habits, bad habits. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, eventually he even uh, caught some deadly disease of cancer. And, you know, his whole life, it, it, it just went for a toss. And um, so he didn't recover. And towards the end of his life, when he was on a deathbed, you know, at that time, he act, when he was just about to give up his life, when he was about to die, he actually saw, and that by that time, actually, Prabhupada left the earthly planet. He finished his pastimes and he, he left. It was post-1977. Uh, this disciple was on the deathbed. And, you know, when he was leaving his body, he actually saw Prabhupada saying that, you know, come, you know, I will take you. So this is the 
uh, glory of executing the mission of the spiritual master. Even if we forget, the guru comes and takes you by your hand just because you have taken the risk of following his instruction. So that is, uh, you know, the power of following guru's instruction. Even if we forget, the guru will take the responsibility and take us back. Godhead. So this is a case where, you know, the disciple could not live up to following the instructions of Prabhupada. We also see many other examples where, you know, devotees gave their heart and soul to actually follow the instruction. And <clears throat> in the process, they have attained such amazing, amazing, amazing uh, blessings from Prabhupada. So we, we read this in the book of uh, Yamuna Mataji. When, uh, you know, the three, dis uh, three couples of... Uh, Prabhupada's disciples, Yamuna Mataji and uh, her husband, uh, Gurudas Prabhu, Mukunda Prabhu and his wife, Malati Mataji, and Janaki Mataji and her husband, uh, Sham Sundar Prabhu. So when all of them, they were uh, instructed to go to London and preach. So all, the, uh, so all of them reached uh, London from US. And they were all new in Krishna consciousness. And before leaving, they, you know, they were even given uh, Brahman Diksha. Prabhupada uh, gave them second initiation. And uh, they left. And, <clears throat> and when they went, when they reached London, you know, they all had to, uh, you know, they all had to, you know, this, uh, decided to approach. George Harrison, who was like the most famous pop singer of those times. So he's a big time, like, you know, in India, how uh, how uh, impossible it is to approach, let's say, the um, somebody like Shah Rukh Khan, somebody like Amitabh Bachchan, how difficult it is to directly approach him. So this person is a few, many more times more than Amitabh Bachchan. Yeah. So he's the pop singer. He was the head of the Apple recording. So every day, uh, all the six of them, they used to wait outside the Apple recording studio to gain entry into the studio. So they were rejected entry, even entry into the studio. So Yamuna Mataji, every day she used to make, uh, because it's Apple studio, every day she used to make something with the Apple, you know, either an Apple pie or uh, an Apple cake or an Apple crisp or an Apple marmalade. Something with the apple she used to make from prasadam and somehow she used to ensure that prasadam used to go inside. So in this way, many, many days they tried it. Finally, after every day sending this, see, look at the faith Mataji had in prasadam, you know, the teachings of Prabhupada. So, you know, after many days, they actually got the uh, invite. And that's when Shamsundaran Prabhu went and he spoke to uh, George Harrison and you know, the rest is history. It's very beautiful. We have to uh, sometimes discuss this amazing pastime. So this is how, uh, you know, uh, faith in the Guru actually can make one be fixed and <clears throat> contribute positively within the group. So it is for us, uh, as I said, uh, to decide who we want to be in a group. Do we want to be Angada? Do we want to be somebody like Taru? Do we want to be somebody like the Vanaras, just get carried away by what anybody says? Or do we want to be like Hanuman? Yeah. Hanuman was silent all through, but when need came, he rose to the need and steered everybody in the right direction towards the mission. So when we are in the group, how, what, what role are we playing? How are we contributing to the group? So I will tell you something interesting about group dynamics how sangha or how groups function. So this is a concept from sociology, but nonetheless, it's very, very relevant to understand how groups function. Since, you know, I see most of you who are all coming today are like, you know, coming from many days and we are, we've been together for quite some time. So uh, how groups function is a very important aspect to understand. <clears throat> So sociology explains that there are five stages of group formation, okay? So these five stages are number one, there is a forming stage, yeah? There's a forming stage. Second is there's a storming stage. 
third stage is a norming stage. Yeah. So fourth stage is called the uh, performing stage. And fifth and the last stage is called the transferring stage. Yeah. Forming, storming, norming, performing, and transferring. So what are these stages? I'll just tell you. So first stage is a forming stage. So imagine we have, uh, let's say we have uh, uh, put a poster that we are having a Bhakti Pravesha program. And so many devotees just pour in from different parts of the country and you know just want to learn. And you know, there's so much attendance from the very first day. Yeah. So this is a forming stage of a group. So in the forming stage of a group, what is there? There is there is a, uh, you know, and at that time, everybody's enthusiastic to do some service, to speak, to interact. And, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So this is the forming stage. So it looks apparently everything appears very nice. It's called the stage of superficial harmony. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, energy in the group, in this forming stage. Yeah. But at that time, there's a lot of tentativeness and ambiguity. That means... Although everybody is very enthusiastic, everybody has their own uh, questions about what is this group all about? Um, is uh, is it, uh, does it, I mean, am I going to get, what's in it for me? Am I going to get something out of it? We have our own ambiguities, our own questions. Yeah, that's why externally everything appears very nice. You know? Everybody appears enthusiastic, but internally, you know, people are not yet convinced. So this is a forming stage. Yeah, it's a stage when everybody's getting acquainted with each other. So especially it was, it's a time when you begin to see only others' glories. You, know, you only begin to appreciate how everybody is, how nice this devotee is, how, how wonderful this person is. We only start appreciating. So this is forming stage, a stage of acquainting, getting acquainted. Then the next stage is a storming stage. Dang, storming stage means... So everybody start having their own assertive behavior. Like every, every devotee wants to have their own niche. They want to establish their own individuality. So this is a time that uh, also people uh, develop differences of opinions. Yeah, there may be conflicts. You may like somebody, you may not like, you may not like somebody. You may see that uh, uh, there is something here for me or, you know, there is some. There are things that I don't like in this. Something that's not uh, suitable for me. You know, you start seeing all the negative sides. This is the storming stage, and this is the stage where the group actually, uh, you know, most of the people fall out. Yeah. So this is a time when we actually have to patiently hold on, understanding the importance of sangha. Yeah, because we all go through these phases. When we come into the Sangha, initially we find everything is so wow, so beautiful, so amazing. But later when we are in the storming stage, you know, Maya gives us so many reasons that I, I don't need this. Yeah, I can do without this. So uh, it is said that, uh, the uh, you know, the... Devo uh, you know, the devotees don't need me. I need the devotees. So we need to have this understanding in our life. Yeah. So this in, during the storming, so just like when there's a huge storm, how do we protect ourselves from the storm? We run under a shelter or we hold on to something, you know, the a tree or something stable, right? Similarly, in the storming stage, uh, where mind gives us so many reasons to fall out of the Sangha. We just have to hold on to our purpose by taking shelter of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. Yeah, by holding on to the lotus feet of Krishna. Yeah, to the teachings of the Guru. Yeah, so we have to just hold on. And if we just pass through this stage, then we enter into the next stage called the norming stage. What is norming stage? Norming stage is a stage where things settle down and we begin to develop deep personal relationships. Yes, some of you here might have actually even you know come to that stage, right? Like you all, I'm 
highly appreciative of all of you, how to how you have your interpersonal relationships. Yeah. So in the norming stage, you we, you know, if we survive the first two stages, we go through the storming stage and then come into the norming stage. We then be, begin to develop deep personal relationships. Yeah, the group becomes more structured. And all individually take their take responsibility. Yeah the group like how each of you take responsibility for some services it's really amazing yeah yeah things needn't be told you yourself take responsibility like Shavya asked me Mataji this week what is the session that we have yeah and you know you yourself take the um uh, uh, a forward step, a proactive step, yeah, to keep things running, to keep things moving. Yeah, so there is a lot of cohesiveness in the group that develops in the norming stage. Yeah, and each member during this stage, they understand their role in the group. Yeah, and they're very happy. They, they find their niche, they, are, uh, they understand their role, they interact, they develop deep relationships. Yes, and and it, uh, you know, it's like deepening of the relationships that were earlier formed, whom you had appreciated beho before, maybe at a later time, you might have seen some loopholes, but then we understand that we accept people as they are and we form deep bondings. This is a stage of norming. Yeah, the whole group becomes very stabilized. Then comes the next stage of performing. Fourth stage. What is the stage of performing? This is when as a group together, you know, they understand that higher purpose for which they have come together. And they together as a group, they do high performance tasks. They do amazing services. Just like the Prachetas, you know, who are the sons of Prachini Barhi, they have done uh, together, you know, the 10 Prachetas, they found, went underwater and they performed severe tapasya. And the Lord himself has uh, appeared and he said, I'm so pleased with your mutual friendship and I'm willing to give you whatever you ask me. Yeah. So, you know, after a deepening of the relationships as a group, you know, we, we come up with high performance. That is, we do something together, uh, also, you know, in the mission of the Lord. Just like we see in the uh, 500 years ago in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, you see the uh, you know three students and the Jiva Goswami, the you know Srinivas Acharya, Narottam Das Thakur, and Shaman and Pandit. How individual they were. The three of them studied under the, tut under the tutelage of Jiva Goswami. After which, individually they went back and they have performed amazing, amazing services that history of the world remembers. And even the Shad Goswamis, the six Goswamis, yeah, how together, although they individually had their own deep sadhana and uh, their uh, personal bhajana, but when they came together, Nana Shastra Vichara Naika Nipuno, yeah, Sadharma Samsthapaka, you know, they came together discussing about the welfare of the world and what is the best things that they could do yeah, together. So this form of a phase of performing. So after stabilizing as a group, together we come into the phase of performing, you know, doing amazing, incredible, wonderful services and understanding the purpose of the group, the mission and executing that mission. And the final stage is what is called transferring. What is transferring? So this results in emergence of uh, the, the leadership qualities within oneself. Yeah. So wherein from this group emerge great leaders and they whatever ideas they have imbibed, whatever ide uh, ideals they have imbibed, whatever teachings they have imbibed, yeah, whatever practices they have imbibed, the skills they have imbibed, they begin to transfer by taking leadership position in themselves, forming new groups and you know taking up <clears throat> leadership services. 
Yeah. So these are the various stages that the group grows through. Yeah, the stage of, what's the first stage? Forming, Matthew. Forming. 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 Yes, what happens in the stage of forming? Yes, sir. What happens in the stage of forming? Yes, People start inquiring about the thing, what uh, about spirituality, and then they join. So the much group. Of, of excitement. Yeah, it's a stage of excitement, stage of inquiry, stage of getting acquainted with each other. Yeah, that's a stage of forming. What's the next stage? Storming. Storming. Yes. What what's what happens in the stage of storming? Everyone just want to establish their one positions. They started seeing the uh, negative part of uh, others. Yeah, it's a stage of conflict. Yes, it's a stage of conflict. You begin to <laughs> see the uh, shortcomings of others. Everybody wants to establish their own niche, you know, my uh, area, my territory. Yes, that's a stage of storming. Yeah, because in, in the first stage of forming, there is a superficial harmony. But like going deeper, you all you always want to have your own niche. So that's the stage of storming. After storming, what happens? Norming. 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 Yes. What happens during norming? We start making deep relationships. Yes. yes. Yeah. We begin trusting each other. We begin making deeper relationships. Yes. We make good friendships. Yeah. Friendships that really yes. help us so much yes. in our journey. Yeah. In fact, even after uh, the emergence, that is the final uh, stage of, you know, in individually emerging out as leaders, they still always revisit this parent group and draw nourishment and you know uh, and uh, friendship and you know a lot of happiness from the parent group that they originally belonged to. So it all depends on this norming stage. What happens after norming? Performing. Performing, yes, performing is where together they live up to a a sublime purpose. Yeah. They execute great roles. They do some wonderful services together. And after which, finally, the stage of transferring. 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 Yeah. What, transferring. Happens, what happens during transferring? transferring? Great leaders. leaders. Yes. Yeah. So during transferring, we will form great leaders. Learned. Yes, leaders emerge out and whatever has been learned through this journey, through this whole process is given to the society. Yeah, they take forward the skills and ideals they have learned in this whole process. It's taking forward. Okay, so these are the, uh, you know, the group dynamics uh, uh, that, you know, we all go through. So it's nice to be aware of, you know, how we are being a part of a group and how the group is contributing to us. And what, in which way can we contribute to the group and how we can uh, develop some good interpersonal relationships with like-minded people and how these relationships can actually contribute so much to our own individual and collective growth. Yeah. So these are uh, the dynamics of a Sangha. Yeah. Once we have an understanding of this, we need to know three things in life. That is... Uh, most of the times, uh, like last session, I had uh, one. I had given one session on friendship. So I I received so many messages saying that you know, Matiji, I have no friends. Or so any times I make friends, they don't last for long. And I know I, I feel so lonely. I got so many messages saying that. Yeah. So uh, it is very important that we understand how we make relationships with these three, who is superior to us, to us who is equal to us and who is subordinate to us. So Bhagavatam gives a very beautiful verse in the fourth canto in the Dhruva Charita section where Narada Muni is instructing Dhruva Maharaj. He says, Gunadhikan mudam nipse, anukrosham gunadhamar, 
maitrin samanam amvichche na tape rabhuyate yeah so what does this mean gunadikan mudam lipset gunadikan whenever we meet somebody superior to us mudam lipset mudam means one should feel pleasure yeah anukrosham gunadhaman gunadhaman means if we meet somebody who is lesser than us yeah who is junior to us or who is subordinate to us yeah anukrosham we should show them compassion yeah maitrim samanam anvichche so if we meet somebody who is equal to us with them we should make friendship yeah so if we do this what happens nataya natape rabhuyate the tapatraya like we have three fold miseries so these the tapatrayas do not affect us that means we are relieved of the miseries of this world just by understanding how to maintain relationship with our superiors equals and subordinates but unfortunately prabhupada in the purport describes about what is our attitude yeah when we meet somebody superior to us what happens we become very insecure yeah if we meet somebody who is subordinate to us we become very condescending what is the meaning of condescending that means we we try to put them down we try to show our superiority complex yeah we try to prove ourselves to be superior to people around us and maitri and if we meet somebody equal to us maitri friends what is our tendency we want to brag about our own self yeah we tell about our own glories you know what all i did this recently thada thada you know this this nature comes up so do you relate to what i say so this is how we generally have the tendency to relate yes how when we meet someone superior to us equal to us and subordinate to us but bhagavatam is saying narada muni is saying if simply we try to cultivate this genuine habit of you know becoming pleased in the presence of somebody superior to us and not insecure yeah and trying to show compassion to the people who are subordinate to us and not to push them down you know not having that controllership or that mentality and when we meet uh, and make friendship with when we meet people equal to us instead of bragging about our own glories we will be very happy in life yeah the miseries of the life don't touch us the misery of the mind does not affect us so when now the very interesting even i was reading this uh, chapter of uh, i will just end with this uh, uh when nandamuni is instructing this to dhruva maharaj dhruva maharaj in the next uh, tells nandamuni oh nandamuni what you are saying is great but i am not at the stage of the a uh, great pure devotee i still have my material desires so uh first i would rather fulfill them and your instructions are more for those who are exalted and pure at heart so propa uh, in the purport writes an amazing uh, purport propa says that yes for a pure devotee it's a natural thing to happen that you know what i just said but even while in the sadhaka stage when our heart is not pure and even if we have many many material desires in our heart still if we simply worship lord krishna yeah then over a period of time certainly the purification of heart happens and we develop these qualities naturally yeah so even though we have material desires you know akama sarva kamova moksha kama udarati tivrena bhakti yogena rajeta purusham param so this is uh, this is what uh, is uh, described in the bhagavatam even if you have akama sarva kama even if you have full all material desires or no material desires tivrena bhakti yogena just by performing you know tivra bhakti yoga you know uh, intense bhakti yoga one acquires all auspiciousness this is stated in shrimad bhagavatam so i will end it here so today in the topic of sangha we, uh, our primary discussion was about you know how am i contributing to uh, the sangha the dynamics of a group so from the uh, example of ramayan we saw should we uh, the example of angada 
you know, who while being in the group and in, on, in fact leading the group, he, he went into a phase of negativity and started doubting the master in the face of adversity. And the example of Taru, you know, who rebelled in the face of adversity and tried to opt for his own personal agendas. Yeah. And we saw the example of Hanuman, who trusted the good intentions of the master, even in the most adverse situation, and tried to remain loyal and faithful to the instruction by taking shelter of Lord Ram. And, uh, and not only did he survive and remain faithful, but he also helped the whole group by redirecting it into the original direction. Yeah. And uh, with this, we also had seen the various stages of a group formation. Yeah. Stage of storm, uh, forming, storming, norming, yeah, performing and transferring. And through these stages, if one remains, it's, it's, it's very important that if we remain with a group over a period of time, you know, we, we actually reap many fruits. Yeah. So that is why uh, choose a group with, uh, you know, with whom you resonate with, you know, where you find like-minded people and spend considerable amount of time. And over a period of time, over a period of years, you, you actually uh, gain some fruits out of it. Okay, so I would end here. Thank you very much. Any questions, discussion? Hare Krishna, anybody has any questions? Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna, yes, Sadhana. Mataji, I have just uh, one doubt, like doubt or maybe other uh, challenge I'm facing. Mm -hmm. Like at a point we uh, started losing the taste in Harinam or like uh, losing the faith in association or at, at that stage, what should we do to remain in that situation? Continue. Okay. So, uh, so Sadhana, how many rounds are you chanting? 16, Mataji. 16. Fine. So, so that's amazing. First, let me congratulate you. <laughs> you started chanting 16 rounds. And uh, certainly, uh, what do you do? Can I know something about your background? Uh, Mataji, I am uh, here assistant professor in agriculture college. Uh, that okay. college. Uh, okay, so you're in an I, I, assistant professor in an agriculture college. Amazing. So, uh, so your question is, how do you maintain the consistency in chanting your sixteen rounds? Yes, Mataji. Yes. So, so welcome. This is the right forum because we have just started with sadhana. Right. We have completed our sadhacha topic and now we have started the sadhana topic. So the whole entire focus of this uh, forum is to solidify our, our practices and make them consistent. So one of the important factors uh, especially is to maintain and be remain in a sangha. I, I hope you're associated uh, with, some, with some group you know, of like-minded devotees. Uh, where they can inspire you to come back to chant or uh, are you associated with some kind of a group, Sadhana, or is it simply yes. on Before my job, Mataji, I'm associated with the devotees in Banaras. But hmm. uh, after uh, getting job here, from last one year, I didn't get a like, physical association, only through online or uh, like this. So nonetheless, you have to take the personal responsibility to uh, stay connected to some group where you know you find many like-minded people whom you resonate with, and then uh, it's uh, it's also recommended if you can develop a personal relationship. That's what I was talking about, stage number three, yeah, a norming stage, where uh, you can actually develop a, a, a deeper relationship with, identify some people, you know, at least one or two friends with whom. You know, you uh, you actually you know have a wavelength uh, that is similar to yours, 
yeah identify such friends and make good friendship with them especially those who are i mean apart from the qualities that resonate with you look for a person uh who is serious about their bhakti yeah who is sincere about their devotion and make good friends with them and when you make such friendships actually inspire us a lot in the process of our devotion uh you know in, in my personal life i came to krishna consciousness through my friend yeah and uh whatever i have learned and i have given my friend one of another best friend of mine yeah and I, next week she's coming she stays in us now and uh, she's a mother of three and she's initiated by jepata kumari maharaj and she's an amazing devotee now so i mean it's so wonderful when i look back uh, 17 years and how we have uh, like she's my friend since the past 25 years so i know how uh, some friendships when they blossom forth in the shelter of krishna consciousness it it gives us so much of you know it's very uh, subtly gives us that confidence that yes we are together and we are practicing and it it nourishes us also deeply so apart from there are many technical answers to your question but i can say relationships is one thing in bhakti that keeps us very nourished and very inspired in our practices is there are also other things like you know the regular hearing the regular the regular the regularity in our lifestyle uh, following uh, other uh, do's and don'ts yes but one thing that really keep gives us that thrill and uh, that nourishment is a uh, heartfelt a uh, heartful relationships with devotees so i so i if you can uh, get you already have some friend then you know nurture that relationship or if you don't have then make some relationships uh, which will help you in, in the in the path of bhakti and definitely they will take you a long way and give you inspiration in your sadhana i hope this answers your question sadhana yes yes thank you mata ji Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hello. So we have some questions on the chat as well. So let me see. Uh, yeah. So Meghna writes while having in second stage there are ego clashes. How to handle it and be in that group, Mother Ji? Very good question. Very practical question, Meghna. Yes. So ego is something that uh, that that's a wall, right? it creates a wall between two people then uh, so we should learn how to build bridges through humility so one thing is uh, we need to understand uh, as i said that the devotees don't need me i need devotees this is the first teaching we should <laughs> tell ourselves that they all can do without me but i can't do anything without them we should understand our interdependence yes so vaishnava sangha and and that too uh, whenever the sangha comes we should understand this is the mercy of krishna the association of devotees is simply 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 the mercy of krishna when we value it and when we actually see it as a mercy of krishna and are great truly grateful for it you know then you know ego doesn't stand for long in the, uh, especially in the presence of gratitude yeah in the presence of gratitude all other things just fade away gratitude is such a power so when we feel grateful to krishna for the association we are get, getting then you know your ego's game doesn't last long it fades away and then yeah so keep reminding ourselves that this is actually a gift of krishna and i should value it i, I should treasure it and if i do not value it you know krishna can also take it away from me it happens i have seen it many times in my own life that there are some devotees who are like for some reason they just out of association and no matter what for years and years you know they could simply could not come back into association yeah so it's uh, it's there and that is one way of krishna protecting them from committing more offenses so so it's in, what is important is to value Uh, to value to sincerely value what has been given to us to appreciate it as see it as krishna's mercy so then you know we always uh, when we value something we never uh, we don't take it for granted <clears throat> 
and ego gets managed, not an issue. Okay, hope this helps. Yeah, so the how to handle it, just uh, by deeply and sincerely cultivating the attitude of gratitude. Okay, Sharini, yes, thank you to Sharini Haribol. Nice being with you. Riddhi, yes. Uh, a first example of Prabhupada was heart touching. Yes, it is indeed very heart touching. You know how Prabhupada actually takes responsibilities of his disciples, even if we don't. Uh, it's really many, many, many such uh, pastimes of Prabhupada are very heart touching. Okay, so I will end the session here. Hari Bol, thank you to Meghna. First, uh, let me see.